Yes, yeah, so I want to welcome to the show Hudson Biblo, good longtime friend of mine that has been incredibly influential in my own life in terms of crafting the important language and nuances of how to bring the good news of chastity to people who experience homosexual attractions, transgender inclinations. So Hudson, you have been a gift to our ministry and with it is great joy that I welcome you to the program today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Jason. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, Oh, you are more than welcome. And just, I wanted to give our listeners just a, a little bit of background on you. So if you can maybe just uh, introduce them to your story and what, what God's kind of done in your life, and then we'll run through all kinds of different questions, have a conversation in this super important, but very difficult and culturally relevant topic. So yeah, maybe just give the listeners a sense of what, what, what God's been doing in your life and the journey that he's brought you through. Sure thing. Um, well, first of all, thanks for going to this topic because it obviously touches so many people's hearts and um, you know sometimes I feel like the people who are in my shoes you know same-sex attractions and transgender inclinations both part of my story uh, it's it's like there are certain aspects of our story that gets forgotten about like namely the fact that you know we need to be reached out to with love and uh, and 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 walked together with and that's exactly what happened with me. Uh, so I remember same sex attractions from like the earliest of, of ages and memories and transgender inclinations, what they would be called today. And uh, I didn't really know what to do with that stuff. So I kind of just packed it in and let it fester in my mind. And meanwhile, I just kind of lived a regular life as much as I knew It's the only life I knew how to live in the in the Catholic in my Catholic family in the Catholic Church, right? And uh, but I had these these feelings and thoughts and things like that didn't really go away and not that I, I just they just were right because it's just you know where I was and um, and then I started uh, kind of entering the realm of uh, pursuing let's say pursuing validation in ways that were more destructive than not but they were often very sexually connected so unchaste <laughs> I was unchaste before I knew what chastity meant. And, uh, and uh, it, that led me to a lot of sexual experimentation, um, which was, was me trying to find that I had value and worth. I, I look back now and I can easily see that it was largely connected to that. And it wasn't like I had parents who were like neglectful. I love my parents. and They're awesome. Um, but for me, a lot of this had to do with belonging within the, the peers, the group of peers. And I just, for, for one reason or another, didn't feel like I had that, even though I played with the kids like any other kid. But inside my heart, I felt like I didn't have that kind of belonging or, you know what I'm saying? Like it just, I felt like I was on the outside looking in. And so, you know, uh, a whole bunch of things happened to kind of like tilt my head to go towards this idea that being gay is who I am. And um, I was kind of encouraged by the culture, less so back when I was younger because the times were different back then. Um, but still, uh, like later by college anyway it was like you should make this who you are make this who you are and um and i didn't i didn't want to make it who i was uh, so i would say these would be the unwanted same-sex attractions and um so i just kind of held back a little bit and a lot of the unchaste pursuits that i was doing i remember in my teenage years in my 20s were really me trying to proved to myself that I was really straight because at the time I was really thinking in terms of gay straight that's who people are and that was the the paradigm of that I had through which I was able to through which I I looked at the hu hu humanity right I just saw gay straight those glasses I saw and I see things differently now of course uh, having been exposed to bigger questions and and um and I'm really grateful for that because then I was able to see that I can be fully honest with myself about the existence of the attractions and the inclinations that I have, the transgender inclinations, but I don't have to, um, I don't have to take that on. And I'm, I'm way happy that I didn't have to do that. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't have to do what the world was saying and that that's freedom. <laughs> and yeah. freedom to, that's the kind of like the short story. I mean, like, you know, there's probably, you know, there's, there's lots more to it, but I mean, it's, yeah. there's a, there's Freedom and a peace that I have that the world didn't say that was was out there for me. I, I they only said I'd have to. I could only find that freedom if I just said this is who I am. Put myself in that box and like yeah. take. It. I don't want to now, do. I, I can only imagine the pressure of like, look, pick a lane, dude. 
you know, you're either this or you're that, or you're both check your box and live it out. And it's just like, yeah. Oh, which one? And then, you know, and then, like you said, you just start proving to yourself and trying to prove to others. I'm not that thing that I don't want to be. I remember, you know, a buddy of mine, I think one of his grade school, public school teachers kind of announced to the class, I think it was maybe in junior high, that you really can't know if you're gay or straight until you're at least 21 years old. You're not going to know. And so this kid lived in like morbid fear for like a decade that one day he's going to wake up on his 21st birthday and discovered, oh my goodness, all this time, you know, I was gay and I was just, just burying it. But it's just that, 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 that false dichotomy of this is who you are, or that is who you, you know, are going to be. And just the, especially in an adolescent who's going through so many tumultuous hormonal and emotional and sociological changes to feel like, okay, I've got to get this figured out when the very nature of adolescence itself is turbulence is just too much for any kid to have to figure out. Totally Jason. And like my whole foray into the LGBTQ mindset, really, it was what it was. Uh, according to my, under, my according to my expectations of what it was supposed to mean, um, that was entirely due to that simple look for belonging. Like I said, that I felt like I didn't belong with my peers, and I'm like, well, where do I belong? So, and that was a long time ago, you know, in the 80s and 90s, uh, when that kind of began. But I didn't have as much of a social pressure to dive into those thoughts as the kids do today. So I don't. Uh, my heart breaks for the kids who have to navigate the, the the journey of finding belonging with all this other stuff heaped upon that, including in sets of expectations that are oftentimes uh, pointing them to become like romantically involved, you know, or sexually involved or experiment ex- experimenting. And I just don't. Um, I mean, I, I know what it's like to experiment sexually as a young as a young person, as, a, as in my early teens. And all it really did was maybe want to do it, do it more, you know, <laughs> because yeah, yeah. physiologically, God made our bodies with the sense of touch and and things feel good. That means our nervous system is working properly, I guess. Yeah. But, you know, imagine, uh, you know, someone like me who felt I felt a, like a hunger for that belonging and a hunger to be chosen and then to feel that someone would choose me, that was very powerful, you know, whether it's a friendship or anything. And then you start wondering, especially for me, I was wondering because like, it's like, um, like I was looking up to these other guys, for example, to kind of like fill what I felt like I was lacking. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, 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 that was becoming romanticized in there too. And like, well, how do I fit in? Maybe I fit in like a boyfriend. Maybe that's how I'm supposed to fit in with the guys. Yeah. And so, I think this, this kind of applies to everybody. I mean, how many, you know, relationships are there where the girl doesn't so much fall in love with the guy. She falls in love with the idea of being wanted by the guy or just she's in love with the feeling of being wanted more than she even wants him. And just that that feeling of desirability keeps us locked in these relationships. I don't know if in, in your case where they came a point of, you know, you're trying to prove that you're not this, you're not this. You know, did there come a point where you just kind of surrendered and just like, okay, forget it. I'm exhausted. This isn't working. I'm using other people. I'm just going to resign myself to the fact that this is who I am. And then you just, your behavior kind of flowed out of that identity in the new direction. Uh, yeah. I, well, yes and no. Go ahead. Here's the thing. So I remember what you described, like, I'm out of gas. I can't do this anymore. I can't run for myself anymore, right? And I, mean, I was also running from, I was I was molested by a man in my teen. So I was running from that too on top of that, right? Which, I mean, that's going to cause trust issues, if anything. And those are going to impact how you get close to people and develop relationships as well. So that was stacked on top of that too, in my case. But uh, I remember uh, reaching that point where I was like, I'm done. I'm done. And it was, I was looking, it was just finished doing some like bender on looking at like transgender porn and then gay porn. I, I remember looking at it. I was like, well, maybe I'll just look at it. Then I'll know. Right. And then, and then I looked at it and I, I didn't, did, I wasn't like attracted to it like sexually, but I, I found myself riveted because it was so over the edge, you know, and I don't like, I just, and that's one of the, the crazy things about porn. I'm sure everybody who's ever struggled with porn knows that you end up looking at stuff that you never thought you'd look at, and you, you just can't look away. It's like watching a, a train slowly fall off a cliffside or something, right? Yeah. Um, but I remember I was, I was like, what am I doing? Like, if this is who I am, then I have this confirmation. I guess that on top of the fact that when I was getting molested by that guy, I had a 
uh, my body had a physiological response. So there's another thing. And plus, when I was 11 years old, I was already two years deep into using porn. And I wasn't getting turned on by the girls on the pages anymore. Um, so I had all these confirmations, like I said, I, and I said, I'm like, I guess this is who I am. And I just find it like I collapse into a sense of hopelessness, you know, because I want to be a father to say I want to be a husband and a father and, and have a family. And, and that's I think that's a beautiful desire. But to have that totally extinguished because I had taken on the hopelessness of saying this is who I am, man, that was a dark spot. That was a dark spot. But here's the thing. I didn't go and say this is who I am and then run off and try to explore that angle of who I am in some way because God can use everything for his glory. He he used my experience of being worn out and like tired of pursuing relationships to say, man, you need to not pursue sexual encounters right now. You're just going to stay with me. And at this point, I was already kind of coming back to faith. So so it was timing was involved. So even though I came to that point and said, this is who I am, and I was hopeless, and I was like, well, I, you know, maybe I should find belonging in this way. Um, it was as though God just said, don't pursue anyone right now. Just begin to pursue my heart a little by little. Wow. And I, I think it's interesting. You know, you had mentioned the presence of sexual abuse in your past. You know, people that I've spoken to, and I've spoken to probably hundreds at this point who've suffered sexual abuse, some of their, uh, you know, experience afterwards is like, hey, if that's what that gender has to offer me, I will have nothing to do with that gender. So take, for example, some, you know, young woman who's sexually abused. Like, if that's who guys are, guys are out of the picture. And then, boom, block them out. Whereas other people go through that and for some reason jump headlong more into relationships. I remember one young woman telling me, you know, that she had been sexually abused and raped. and But she said that she found a way to never be raped again. And that was to always say yes. And, and I'm just sitting there just taking this in of like, wow, like that's, that's how she was protecting herself of never saying no, because she knows the violation of actually saying no and not having that respected. She figured, well, as long as I always say yes, no one can disrespect my no. And so I think because a lot of people in addressing the homosexuality issue don't fully understand it. They think, oh, well, if you experience these attractions, you must have been molested. You must have a horrible relationship with your dad. And because that's not always the case, you know, some people say, okay, well, because it's not always the case, it's never the case. And so that has nothing to do with my attractions. As a result, so many people who have suffered these things don't take the time to dig of maybe there is some of that stuff that's unhealed, kind of layers the onion that haven't been peeled back that are kind of getting buried underneath the behavior. And, and then we just put the badge of the identity on it and say, hey, look, I'm good. It's not because that happened. That's because who I am. And so obviously so many layers to unpack there. But I guess it just you can't do a cookie cutter definition for where human attractions come from because they're as unique as the human person themselves. Um, that is so true. That is so true. Uh, there is a lot to unpack in what you said there. And, and that's kind of the, I think the big thing is what you said is it's unique as the human experience. And, and if anything, as soon as we make claims that do the opposite of broaden the, the, the breadth of what is going on, uh, as soon as we counter that, we're really stealing, stealing from people the ability to share their stories. You know, like there's 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 people who say that, uh, you know, uh, you're you know, you were never really LGBTQ because you're you I, I walked away from that now. And it's like it's like but but that's not true. That stole my voice. And then about the kid, the, these young kids that are detransitioning and say, well, they weren't really trans. It's like, well, you just stole their voice. And and there's a whole it seems like our society is not really friendly to the idea of broadening the narrative or the set of narratives that exist out there. And and anytime somebody's. Uh, um, a story or their voice gets, you know, um, you know, someone says your story didn't happen or, or, or you you know, that's, that's a, a dangerous thing because, you know, every, we are all here because of our stories, you know, like when, when the person who contacts me, who says, you know, they, they are, uh, they experience same-sex attractions or they'll, they'll use the words I'm gay and I'm just kind of wondering about this or that. And it happens from time to time. Like I need to, accept the reality of of their journey to that point which whatever brought them to a conversation with me and i mean that's that's great and then and then maybe we can just talk and have a beer together and 
and I can listen. That's that's more the bigger thing. But you you, you brought something else I want to talk about is it 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 does like where this stuff comes from is 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 different. Like there there are uh, ideas that it's it's because of an automatic father wound or it's because of an automatic uh, peer ejection. Uh, it, it, there's there's several reasons, and I've heard people voice several reasons, including like let's say. Um, things to do things that might not seem sensible like what you mentioned about a girl who would would not say no to protect herself from feeling violated you know it doesn't seem logical um uh, of guys who um who they're angry at men and they've uh, i've i've heard this this shocked me this was the farthest out and then so that the idea of of having homosexual sex was actually a form of revenge against men because it caused pain and i was like this is this i never thought of before but it's part of the narratives of the rationales. But that brings us, I think that brings us to a bigger picture. It's like, why would people want to continue to inflict pain? That's a bigger topic, resentment and stuff like that. But overall, like all these relational things that happen, like, I mean, our entire lives, you know, um, all of that stuff can't be considered of zero effect, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and every part, I'm sure every every facet of human development and psychology would say that our whole life experience contributes to the formation of who we are today. Um, and in the development of our particular appetites or desires uh, relationally, um, I think is a part of that. And I can I can testify with my own story. After I was molested by that guy, um, I went over 10 years without being able to develop a healthy relationship with another man. And one of the reasons I can see now is because I was terrified of men. I was terrified to be around men. I longed to belong with men. I longed to kind of gain what I perceived they had because I didn't feel confident as a man. But I wouldn't allow myself to get close. So so my desires, of where, where I desired to be, like how, how I desired to develop a relationship was was the whole picture was impacted and and i say particular desires or particular appetites because for example uh i'll think of it like like in in terms of food for example because appetites are you know food relationships there's relational appetites i have an appetite to quench my thirst like my appetite is for thirst quenching beverage but i don't have a particular appetite for like dr pepper or like a particular you know something like that or orange crush you know what i mean and so i have an appetite to be in healthy relationships where I feel loved but that doesn't imply that that I was created with a particular appetite to be loved by that person or that person you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. no I, I think what you're hitting on there is a huge untapped piece of male friendship I, I went to an all boys high school you know in the 1990s and then culture hadn't shifted to be more accepting of those experiencing attractions and so this melting pot of a thousand you know, adolescent boys. It's a lot of testosterone on one piece of property. Uh, but it was such, you know, by today's term, a homophobic environment of like, you're gay. I'm not, I'm not gay. You're gay. Oh, you're totally gay. And, you know, I often say there's a, there's a word that describes how we were behaving. In, in the Greek, it's idiotes. And in English, that's translated as idiot. Um, but I think we are so insecure and our own masculinity that we somehow felt the need to hyper masculinize and distance ourselves from anyone who appeared at least on the surface in any way remotely effeminate and you know maybe those guys some of those guys may have been a little effeminate but weren't attracted to other guys you know maybe some of the guys who were right next to us in class were the most masculine by stereotype did experience those attractions but never would have said a word and in the meantime we probably have no idea the unspoken damage that that was taking the toll that was taking in their own lives because if we would just grow up a little bit and become friends with people who experience same-sex attractions instead of being threatened by that, I mean, what a blessing that that would be in their life to know that, hey, you know I experience these attractions and you're not threatened by it. You're not scared by it. You're not so afraid I'm going to hit on you that you just distance yourself from me. And I think that leaves a, not a father wound, but a brother wound, so to speak, in so many of these young guys that they don't get to experience chaste, male friendship of authentic male bonding because so many insecure guys are too busy distancing themselves some of them because i don't want to be associated with you because if i have a real friendship with you everybody's gonna think you know i'm gay too and then there goes my reputation with the girl and so i just 
feel for so many young men who are just deprived of just basic male friendship because it's just bigotry to deny someone human friendship because the attractions they experience or even the lifestyle that they choose to fully lead. So regardless of attractions or behavior, I think we are not only depriving you know our, them of our friendship, we're depriving us ourselves of their friendship, which is a loss, in my opinion, in both directions. So I don't know if you could speak to a moment of just the importance of guys getting over themselves and being friends <laughs> with guys who experience these attractions. Yeah, honestly, Jason, it's interesting to see how fear can motivate people into isolation, right? Mm -hmm. And isolation kills and it kills relationships too, right? And and I remember going in those classrooms and those hockey dressing rooms, like you know, nobody wanted to be, you know, oh, that's the gay kid. Well, guess what? You were going to be the target, right? It's almost mm -hmm. like it, 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 it allowed the, uh, all the energy to be focused on one person to take on the suffering so that, I don't know, the rest of the kids could feel okay about themselves maybe. I guess, mm -hmm. you know, in the whole lens of what bullies do, right, they, they just deflect an interior hurt, right? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it, 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 that's, how, that's what human beings – seem to do right it's bigger yeah. than the topic and, and for unfortunately but i really love what you said there it's like earlier you said um how uh you know like we would deprive them of our friendship but like the truth is the more that we know people who experience again a bigger question a bigger picture uh the more that we know people who experience a broader uh like a, a, a different um outside of ourselves and outside of our bubble i'll say um, it gives us all an opportunity to uh, maybe have uh, misconceptions being uh, um, melted away, uh, you know, and maybe it allows us to walk together in a way that could possibly be constructive or even or even loving. And of course, there's parameters and stuff like that, because I know that if I had uh, like uh, one of my friends who self identifies as LGBTQ, if he came over with a boyfriend or something like that. And I had little children around and I, I wouldn't want them to be expressing affection in front of my little children because then I'd have to deal with that question before a time that I believe is appropriate as a parent. And there's room for that, mm -hmm. you know, because parents need to have their, you know, their authority over their children. They need to be able to exercise a, their, their rights, their parental right, which, of course, is being eroded by the law. But that's another topic. Um, but uh, but the idea is that when, when we get to know each other's stories, I think that's what I'm really getting at. When we get to know each other's stories, then then at least we can maybe get a little disarmed, still being mindful of what we believe and why, and still being able to, we always want to be able to point people to the greatest truth and freedom ever, which is the love of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And the moment that we become too afraid to do that, we're no longer accompanying somebody. We're walking with somebody somewhere, but it's might not be towards Jesus Christ. And if it's the other direction, I don't think that's a place we should be walking towards. Uh, yeah, now, now we may be stepping a little bit of a, out of our realm of expertise, but do you think it's the same way for women that is it as important for them, you know, are they really lacking in female sisterhood, you know, or, you know, maybe in some of their cases, are they lacking in authentic male friendships in their life? Because maybe they've been immersed in this, you know, t truly toxic masculinity. Like I remember one girl, you know, telling me that just walking down the hallway of her high school is a violating experience of the way the guys would talk and grope and stare. And just, I mean, that repulsive behavior by male, I think, sends so many females into just this, Ugh, if that's all you guys have to offer, I'm just frankly not interested. And then they might feel a spark of attraction for another girl on an emotional level, but because they're living in this hyper hypersexualized culture, think, oh, that must be a sexual attraction. Because if it's any attraction, it's got to be sexual because everything's sexual, right? And start questioning her own identity. And, and I've seen this time and time again, you know, traveling over the last 20 years, the students who open up to me, but just this confusion that any human attraction is ipso facto a sexual attraction and the confusion that can come from that. Yeah, uh, well, that that thing you last said there, I think, is like so much at the core of what's missing in our world is we it's we're not able to have friendships because there's an assumption that if I want to be around you, if I'm drawn to you, then, gee, that must be some romantic or sexual tilt. I'll, yeah, I'll expand it beyond sexual to be romantic tilt. Right. Because if somebody's got their romantic interest, it could become sexualized, you know, mm -hmm. um, and all of that points to 
the set of expectations. What do I do with these attractions? Do I acknowledge that, hey, it's actually normal and healthy for me to want to be around other men because I need brotherhood. Uh, men need brotherhood. Women need sisterhood. Or do I uh, remain uh, entrenched below the realm of like in a narrow, narrow narrative where there is no room for that kind of conversation where they say that if you uh, are a drawn to somebody, then it means, you know, you, you should question your, your mindset at the very least. And interestingly enough, um, it seems to fit with what there's, there's the, there's an activist, you know, movement there at the same, same time. And a lot of the activists are on YouTube with videos that are clearly targeted towards young people who are trying to find their way, just like I was. And they're saying things like, if you even question who you are, how you fit in, if you even question, that's it, then it actually means you are trans. That's the, that's the new thing right now. And it's like, or maybe it's probably not even new, uh, but it's, that's what I'm seeing more and more of. And so when those types of things are being said to young people who are authentically trying to find where they belong, like authentically trying to, to know and come to know that they're loved and have value and worth, um, it's, it's not going to be of zero effect in how they come to see what their journey towards fulfillment might look like. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I remember reading last year, a uh, article came out in the Atlantic magazine, which is a real left-leaning um, magazine. And I saw it at the airport newsstand and it said, you know, your daughter's 13. She says she's trans. What do you do? And so I picked up the article. And I said, oh, this, this will be interesting. And it's a really long article. And, and it starts off with the story of this girl, Claire. She's 12 or 13 years old to start. And she comes to her mom and dad and says, hey, mom, dad, I'm trans. I want a, you know, a radical double mastectomy. And you know, the parents are obviously a little bit shocked, but they said, okay, honey, well, let's not jump on this. Let, not, mom and daddy need to do some research, okay? But we're listening to you and we hear you. And so mom and dad started reading up on this. And now mom was well-educated. She was a pharmacologist. The dad was well-educated. But everything that they'd read would basically say, look, if your kid says she's trans, she's trans. Don't try to suppress it. Don't try to push against it. That's just child abuse. But now this didn't sit well with the parents. And so they said to Claire, Okay, clear. Look, here's the deal. No more YouTube, no more social media. Look, we'll, as a compromise, we'll let you have Instagram, but that's it. And we're going to go camping this weekend and we're going to play more family board games and we're going to start doing this. And they just started immersing themselves more fully into this girl's life while at the same time unplugging her from a lot of the social media outlets. And within a year or so, uh, what Claire discovered is a new set of female friends that, you know, at the time when she was going through this, she just didn't fit the female stereotype of pink bows in the hair and this, that, and she, she liked getting dirty and, you know, and playing soccer and like, she was just more of a tomboy and she just felt the problem must be my gender. The problem isn't gender stereotypes. The problem is my gender. So that's what needs to get fixed. And within a year or so, she found a whole new set of friends that were into the same stuff she did and were totally comfortable in a female body and the feelings actually resolved. Now, if the parents just went with what the you know transgender movement was saying, I mean, she'd be getting puberty blockers and cross-sex hormone therapy and sending her down this trajectory of really literally no return um, until so much damage has been done. And so I, I think, imagine you know where you're at up in Canada, it, it's gotta be even more aggressive of just like, hey, if you think it, if you feel it, and, and honestly, who listening out there hasn't struggled with their gender in one way or another. I mean, haven't we all at some point, you know, am I, am I, am I that much of a man? Am I truly what a woman is supposed to be? But I think because so many of these cultural stereotypes can be so literally suffocating that people see the only way out is fixing the gender and then the problem goes away. Yeah, I, I think that is kind of what's happening. Um, and you know, uh, what you just said at the end there, um, you know, everybody, I'm sure I am <laughs> okay. Maybe like pretty much everybody has at one point wondered if they measure up to be what they think a man should be or a woman like do you know, am I a good woman? Am I a good mom? Am I a good dad? Or am I good at who I am or whatever? And, um, I know that the, one of the cues, the second cue in LGBTQIAA is for questioning. The, the second cue means questioning. And I always saw that and I was like, well, wait a second. 
everybody has questions because nobody's nobody's confidence is uh, utterly perfect. Um, so technically, that umbrella of labels is set up to virtually encompass everybody. Everybody has a spot inside those those things. And the other one is the the uh, A for asexual or aromantic. It's like well, every kid that's prior to the age of sexual awakening who thinks the opposite sex is icky or you know what I'm saying. Um, they would not experience a sexual attraction to somebody, so they could find themselves as asexual or aromantic. And, and of course, they're getting exposed to those ideas before the age of sexual awakening, but they're becoming conditioned to seeing themselves in terms of those types of I, I, uh, mindsets. And, um, and what I worry about is that if, if that becomes the normal way of seeing oneself and the normal way of thinking, especially given all the, the influences of the, our mainstream culture, which perpetuate that, um, it'll become harder and harder for them to see beyond it. You know, that's, that, and that kind of as a concern for me. Um, and another thing you mentioned earlier, uh, it said that this, this girl, had, they took her, they unplugged her from the, uh, the internet, you know, that kind of stuff. And I think about that too, because like, you know, every kid comes to a point where they need to stake out on their own and have an identity apart from their parent, right? And they become their own person incrementally, right? Through, uh, you know, through anything. Or usually, I mean, like the hero's journey talks about, you know, you, you meet somebody, but that's what, that's what movies are like, like Frodo and, uh, you know, they, they meet some wizard and then they go and have this crazy adventure, right? Or Luke Skywalker, he meets, you know, uh, you know, Yoda, you know, and then there's this crazy adventure, but that that happens in in all of our lives. We some we we encounter someone outside of the nest is what I'm saying, and they bring ideas to us, and those ideas influence in some, us in some ways. And as soon as as soon as a kid gets that iPhone or or they're around other kids with iPhones, and then they, or you know not I, I'm not I'm not picking on Apple here, just <laughs> did, did media. You know they have access to the whole internet at a few clicks here. Um, they the the after effect is that the whole world has access to them and that's the scary thing and as soon as they're starting to ask questions which they might not feel safe enough to talk to with their parents they're going to ask the internet and the internet will have plenty of answers that will be tilted in ways not befitting of the parental value set and the parents will have a very tough time uh, recovering from that which kind of is a big uh, builds a good case to have uh, real healthy face-to-face -face relationships with other like-minded families as opposed to throwing your kid into the world of the, the digital world when they are like they're trying to find where they belong and people will tell them where they belong you know yeah you know and i i think what you said is so true especially in terms of how porn shapes our view even of human sexuality like i've met a number of young teenage girls who told me that they do want to get married but they want to enter into an asexual celibate marriage and it's you know it's kind of like okay where, where's this coming from and you start talking to them and what it is is the only perception they have of sexual intimacy is porn and if that's what relations are between a husband and wife well yuck and so many people even without seeing porn when they're first introduced to the birds and the bees through their parents' best intentions, it's common that they're like, okay, that's gross. Okay, that, that's just gross. You know, I remember a friend of mine told his kids how babies were made, and the kid was like, Dad, you know, how long have people been doing this? You know, and I told him, tell him the 1960s. And he said, Dad, like, is there any other way? And dad's like, no, that's pretty much it, kid. And uh, so I think, you know, that's natural to be like, okay, gross. And, but because of the pornified culture, people are getting like, no, no, that's really gross. Like, why would I want to let someone do that with their body to my body? And, and then they get on the internet and think, oh, asexual, that's who I am. It's like, no, you are sexual in virtue of being a human being. You are male or female. You are a sexually dimorphic species. And so words need to mean something. Like my, this microphone is asexual. This desk is asexual. It is not a sexually reproductive being. But sexual is who you are. And people are like, oh, I know. But by asexual, I mean like I don't like sex. It's like, okay, but that's not what the word really means. Like you yep. are a, a sexual being who experiences a revulsion to what you have come to understand as sexual intimacy. And maybe the problem there isn't sex per se. Maybe the problem is the way that the beauty of God's plan for human sexuality was twisted and warped. And maybe your reaction was natural 
and healthy and good because you should want to vomit that up if that's what it's supposed to be. But, you know, like it was it Steve Jobs who started Apple said, people don't know what they want until you show it to them. And so if, but the thing is, human sexuality as God intended between a husband and wife, properly speaking, should be shown to nobody because it's behind a veil. Only the husband and wife experience that. And so because of the nature of the hidden and the sacred, it, it almost takes faith to believe it could be beautiful, especially for young people who's been immersed in such a pornified view of it. But um, thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, you know, what you said there about the, the whole shift of seeing sexuality as, well, I'll use the words that I, I use, I guess, is like, I went through a transition of seeing sexuality as nothing more than a commodity. It would get what I wanted. I'd give girls what they wanted, you know, and then we'd be on our way. But then there was a shift where I began to see it as a gift, a beautiful gift that could be given back to God. And of course, when you give a gift that when you give a gift that matters, there's always greater joy in giving it. And then, well, what, uh, sexuality is a very important gift I see now. So I do have a lot of joy in giving that gift to God. But the idea of like that transition, like what happened? And back to the idea of expectations, my expectations until that point were were formed basically by, by soaking in the slew of the world, which just kind of... I just picked up all the stuff that I was soaking in. I didn't know that I needed to swim upstream instead of float downstream, you know, and just let, let, let the world take, take over my mindset. Um, and so I began to see it as a gift. A lot, a lot of it had to do with um, being exposed to the idea that um, I had value and worth as a beloved little S son of God. And I just never really thought of myself about myself that way. It was, it was kind of like in the, in, the, in the realm of theology of the body and understanding, like, you know, God has authored us for something good, not just to, like, you know, white knuckle and deny what we've been brought to believe is bad. Like, there's something beautiful here, and it's a great way to, for a husband and wife to express their love in, 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 a, in a most profound way, which brings, which with an openness, not necessarily grace, but an openness to new life. And it's learning about those thoughts, though, um, what I worry about, it's not worry, but like what I what I see is that as the narratives become less broadened, as we're allowed to talk about these things, these things less and less, fewer and fewer people are going to be exposed to the idea of sexuality as a beautiful gift that can be reserved and shared and which is sacred. And I mean, ever since so like, like I mean, I'm I'm single, I'm not married, I'm not even really pursuing anyone right now. But the fact that I see my sexuality as a gift now, now I'm not giving it out to, you know, a spouse, I have the joy of knowing I'm giving that gift to God. And that joy is going to be there all the time. I don't only experience the joy when there's someone to receive it. God receives my gift first and foremost. And, and it's like, I want people to taste that joy. I want, I want the whole world to know that joy, you know. Um, but again, as the conversations become minimized through the use of like, let's say, language that's less clear, language that doesn't allow people to see a bigger picture. I know that those 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 realities that sometimes require clarity to get to, um, like the difference between chastity and celibacy, that's huge. Um, as that comes clear, you're, you, 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 you can enter into a whole new understanding of 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 what uh, the gift of self looks like. You know, it's not just I'm not just giving myself to God and like like regretting every day of my life because I can't go have sex. It's like, it's, it's like, instead, I get to make the choice every day to strive to, to love Jesus more, and give my heart to him such that uh, in preparation for that holy spousalship, whether it be in uh, marriage to the church through a religious order, or marriage to an opposite sex spouse, in a way that in a relationship that is open to chastity. And therein comes the, the necess necessity to talk about what does chastity really mean? Well. Now, how would you give as an elevator speech to someone unfamiliar with the term of, okay, well, what's the difference between celibacy, chastity, abstinence? I mean, potato, potato. I mean, all three in my brain just mean repression. So, you know, peel apart the, the distinctions between those words, you know, uh, just elevator yeah. speech if, to help someone who's not familiar with that. I'm not good at elevator speeches, but I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> so, uh, like, ab abstinence obviously is about abstaining from some kind, something or uh, abstaining from typically a behavior or whatnot. Chastity is to do with the state of the heart. I mean, there's books written about chastity, so I'm, I'm just looking at distinctions here. 
Um, and uh, celibacy is, we're talking about a state in, a state in life, wh or, which is a celibacy is also a discipline, right? But it has to do with the state in life. For example, I am unmarried, so I am in the celibate state in life. I can be in the celibate state in life whether I am chaste or unchaste, or whether I am open to growing in chastity or not open to growing in chastity. That doesn't, that doesn't change whether or not I'm in a celibate state. And that's a huge thing for us to, for the whole world to know one day, is there's a difference between unchaste celibacy and chaste celibacy. And Lord, do I hope that there are beautiful examples of chaste celibacy that arise. And I see them. Actually, in a lot of cases, the people who have walked away from LGBTQ mindsets, they are beautiful examples of chaste, holy celibacy. They're not just being celibate or in the celibate state while resentfully, you know, wishing that the church would change. And I think that's the key is where there's resentment, there is no chastity. I forget which saint or said that, but it's like chastity is the enemy of resentment. So where there's resentment, um, it might not be chaste celibacy. Wow. So, so, so resentment is the enemy of chastity. Is that what the saint said? Resentment is the enemy of chastity? Chastity is the enemy of resentment. Uh, something oh, cha like Chastity is the enemy of resentment. Okay. I mean, they would go in both directions, that there'd be an yeah. enmity between the two. Um, but yeah. I mean... You know, one word that you said repeatedly, uh, you know, is joy, joy, joy. You know, in the, in the world, I think, just tells people, look, you got to fit into one box or the other, like either gay pride or gay shame. Like those are the options. Either you hide in the closet, you repress your desires, you don't tell anyone because otherwise they'd hate you or come out, put a re rainbow flag on your car, you know, go down a gay pride parade, live the lifestyle, get rid of God, the church and the Bible, do whatever you want. Gay pride, gay shame, pick your pick your you know, lifestyle. And a lot of people just feel like, uh, okay, well, I don't want to throw a God, but I don't want to live ashamed because it's not like I chose this. It's not like I woke up today. Oh, I'll be attracted to these people. And, you know, you're kind of elevating it to like, look, it's not one or the other. There's this lifestyle of chastity that actually brings joy. Because, I, you know, I remember one saint saying, the devil doesn't care how many times you fall. The devil just wants to get you discouraged. Because if he can get you discouraged, then you're in the boat, so to speak. Then, you know, then he can get what he wants out of you. And I think if people think that gay pride and gay shame are the only choices, res discouragement from a Christian perspective is the only possible outcome if those are the only two, two choices that are before me. Whereas you're saying, well, no, there's, there's this other option of chastity. And if you get this piece, then you get the identity piece that, you know, gay isn't who you are. And so you, I would imagine, would not say, you know, as you went through this quest that, you know, I am gay, I'm, I'm practicing chastity, but I'm gay, you know? So, you know, I, why would you say that that's wrong for someone to say that? Like, hey, I'm on board of the church, I practice chastity and I'm gay. You know, why would you try to help someone to understand, you know, why that's not the precision of language that's needed to help us move forward? Yeah, <laughs> that's a big question. Yeah, um, it is. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Uh, so, I mean, first of all, like in a conversation, so hypothetically, if someone was willing and ready to be open to growing and understanding of terminology, great. That's what I'll, I'll angle on. But typically, I don't think people are ready to have that conversation. So uh, I might be looking at a different angle. But the idea of like saying I'm gay and chaste, um, that I, as far as I understand, and uh, I, I'd be happy to receive correction from people, but to be, to be chaste, sorry, to strive for chastity, right? Because none of us are perfectly chaste. We have moments. So let's talk about striving to be. We can always be successful at striving. To strive to be chaste involves something called successful integration. And successful integration of our sexuality uh, is in the catechism, that phrase. Successful integration has to do with... Um, not being not successful, you know, not successfully integrating what God has written into your sexuality. And and when, when the catechism is speaking about this stuff, and of course this comes after understanding that the catechism talks about nature in terms of what God has authored into creation, not just what feels natural. You have successful integration, meaning um, uh, honoring what God has authored into creation. Now for me, as a male, if I if I take on the mindset that my complementary person, uh, not just in friendship, but in a romantic or sexual way, is also a male, I'm actually rejecting uh, how God has authored my body into existence. So I'm actually participating in the rejection of successful integration by taking on the idea that m my complement person in a romantic or sexual way should be a man. 
likewise, when I was taking on the transgender uh, mindset, um, I was uh, rejecting that God wrote me as a man. So I was also rejecting chastity. Now, that's not to say that, um, uh, how do we say this? It's like chastity can be uh, rejected or successful integration can be uh, countered in uh, any number of ways by all sorts of people. So it's not like something that discriminates. But when a person says my compliment is a person of the same sex instead of the opposite sex in terms of romantic or sexual endeavor, that is decisively counter to successful integration, as is the idea of saying I am not what God authored me to be. And so those are things that I, I wish the conversation would get to. But a lot of people are still at the point of trying to figure out the difference between chastity and celibacy, let alone diving into what chastity really, you know, could like entails. Yeah. Now playing the devil's advocate, let's say there's someone out there listening who's thinking, okay, well, wait a minute. So are you asking me just not to be honest with myself to basically say, okay, this attraction is not something I have. This isn't who, uh, you know, help walk them through that. You're not telling them they can't be honest with themselves. They can't, it's not that they can't say, yeah, these attractions are persistent and they're consistent and they don't seem to be going away, but just because I've, I have them and maybe I've always experienced them for as long as I can remember, it doesn't mean that gay is who I am. Well, to, to, to go into this, um, there's, there's a few things. The first thing is that I had to come to realize that though I had those experiences and I experienced those and I was LGBTQ mindset and everything like that, um, there was I had a shift in mindset where before I believed that gay is who I am and who I forever must be. And then after thinking about this and being open to ideas that were outside of what the world was telling me, I realized that that is false. I don't need to be LGBTQ. I don't need to take on, I mean, this is regardless of the attraction. I can be fully honest with myself about the attraction. These attractions I experienced, right on. But that is not the same as mindset. Of, and and mind, from mindset comes how I decide to describe myself and how I describe to define myself. Those, those derive from mindset and those are distinct, right? Those are distinct because when it comes to making choices about how I see myself, those are something I choose and the attractions are not something I choose. So logically we have to consider them distinct. I think that is, that actually is one of the very first distinctions that uh, has been pointed out to me that has been very helpful for people to see beyond what they have been told to believe by the mainstream media. In fact, one person I know was, um, this is, this is tragic. I, I, I share the story in honor of this guy and his, his honesty. He was in his 60s, and he says to me, after coming to realize that attractions experienced don't equate to a mindset or an identity or a self-description or definition, he says to me, after he's thought about this and prayed about it, he's like, I realized that all these years I thought I was gay, but now looking back and thinking and praying about this, I see all I was looking for was friendship. And this guy's like almost his whole life was stolen from him by, you know, the, the, the mindsets of, of activists who coached him to believe this sort of thing. Like that's tragic, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I remember hearing a man say the same thing. He wrote that, you know, he lived a pretty promiscuous life with other guys. And then he said, after all these years, the gay bars and this and that, that I realized, and these are his words that I wasn't homosexual. I was homo emotional that I was longing for the affection, the admiration, the approval, the attention just that my dad and male peers never gave me. And the world, in effect, taught me to sexualize my problems. And so in, in your own you know, story and in your own case, when it comes to attractions, I remember you once using the phrase with me as your attractions began to shift that I remember you saying, well, I wasn't trying to pray the gay away, but I think, I mean, how, you know, speak to maybe how potentially dangerous and harmful and discouraging is if a person thinks that kind of it's their spiritual responsibility to change their attractions. And when they make that the focus of their attention, kind of gauging their spiritual progress by how fast their attractions change, just, just how, how discouraging that could be. And then even in your own case, this is kind of a second part of that question, you know, what happened in your own life when you took the focus off the attractions per se and focus more on the behavior and changing that, you know, how did that flow into changes when it comes to transgender inclinations, same-sex attractions, you know, how much was the behavior shift 
a part of the attraction shift. So those two pieces, you know, the, the praying the gay away and like, is that helpful or hurtful? And then what happened, your own story when it came to those attractions, once you focus on the behavior first. So like, you know, thankfully for us as Catholics, we know that the church doesn't actually like teach that it is our job to pray the gay away. Like that's, the church doesn't say that that's something that we ought to do, but the church does say, I mean, it did, but we have the permission to, to pray for whatever we want to pray, really. So there's an openness for us to pray for that we want, but it's not like the church is saying, look, you need to be fixed, so you better start praying on this. And if you don't, then you're some kind of horrible sinner. You know what I mean? And so, like, the first thing with the idea of praying the gay away, what I, what I worry about is when people become fixated on that is that it sets expectations such that maybe one day this magical thing will happen and suddenly I'll be, I don't know, changed or whatever. And, um, like, yeah, but, like, then that doesn't happen. And then the person didn't have their expectations met and then they're all angry at the world. And some of those people become, like, very powerful anti-Catholic ap- uh, apologists. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, the idea of leading with the idea that we should pray the gay away, or, like, that's super dangerous. Not only does it, like, uh, allow, uh, bring about the situation where people's expectations aren't met, and if they want to walk away from that stuff, they feel, sometimes feel even worse, but they also sets up the, the it sets up resentment where someone might say, like, oh, to hell with the Catholic Church, then um, I'm going to try to take you guys down because I was hurt during this process. And that's not good, you know. Um, I don't think that's good at all. The other part there, like I said, we 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 can pray for whatever we want, you know. I've never personally prayed for the attractions to go away. Um, they they did diminish though, and I'll get to that in a second, um, which was kind of interesting because I never actually like even sought that out. <laughs> it was like I just noticed one day. I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> like I was like. Why I haven't experienced these attra- this, this attraction for a long, long time. Maybe I'll go with that. I'll just talk about it right now, actually. Um, yeah, it was like an after effect of, of like trying to strive to love Jesus more. What happened? You know, that that's not the easy answer. Well, I was I had become exposed to the idea of living a holy life and trying to honor the gift of my sexuality and giving it to God. I also came to learn about a lot of neurological uh like let's say aspects, especially to do with uh, the use of pornography and how that like makes new neural highways in your brain and, and, but your brain is efficient. So it, as, as you don't use highways anymore, they, you know, they go away and you form your brain in different ways, so to speak. And it kind of reminded me of the idea of like uh, appetites, like fleshly appetites, especially um, they, they, they grow or strength, strengthen or weaken in the ways that we feed them. Right. Uh, I, I use the example with somebody who's like, if you if you if you were like totally addicted to your particular fast food chain forever, and then you took five years off to cleanse your body, and then you have that fast food again, your body is like, yuck, yuck, this is not for me anymore, right? So it's like we know that things change uh, our, our appetites, and it's, that's an imperfect analogy, but we know that the pleasures of the flesh uh, are um, strengthened or weakened based on what we do, and uh, especially especially the sexual pleasures of the flesh, like they. Uh, like in the more you practice them, the more you want them. I mean, the whole the whole story of the crazy craziness about going down the roads of porn is is an example of that. Anyone who's ever struggled with lust knows that. Um, so, oh man, okay. So where were they? Yeah. So, uh, so short story. <laughs> See, I'm, there's so much I want to talk about. I'm losing my mind. So, so I'm wondering, like, my I noticed that these uh, attractions started to diminish. I'm like, well, what happened? So I was pursuing that holiness. And, and so for, for a long, long time, so maybe like a year, a year, year and a half, I had an 18 month stint where I was like, God protected me from the desire to even think about pornography, which was awesome. But I was practicing that trying to live for God. And, and so what that did was drew me to have better decisions when it came to uh, um, the, the sexual realm and pornography. And so in that I was gaining confidence and this is the big thing we talk about behavior how did i change my behavior well underneath the behavioral change was a change in my confidence because for the first time in my life i realized that i had an ounce of self-control and that felt good because i knew that i had little self-control before and i and i was aware that 
the girls that I was interested in, because I was interested in girls, I was, I was interested in anybody that would give me attention. That's really what was going on. And uh, But they didn't want a guy that had no self-control. So having a little bit of self-control was a boost to my self-confidence. And, and in that, I kept on uh, growing that. And then what happened here? With um, I ended up feeling confident enough to, to so the confidence entered into how I related with other human beings, including men. And so my increased confidence allowed me to feel like the men weren't on some pedestal and I was more of an equal. And I felt like I finally crossed the threshold of entering the fold of men, like into the wolf pack. And after that, I realized that, wait a second, I don't feel, I don't feel the need to, you know, uh, get from these guys what I'm lacking because I feel like I'm a man now. And so there's the, there was a romantic angle of attractions that that had diminished, a romantic, same-sex romantic attractions. There was also same-sex sexual attractions, and I'm I'm just making a difference here because they're they're different to me. Um, and I remember like you know the the, the driven sexual attraction um, after I had been away from porn for a long, long, long time, and I had begun to practice uh, chastity and 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 placing my temptations into the into the into the arms of Jesus and uh, winning the battles by the power of God and, and trying to cooperate with him uh, gaining that confidence uh, I found that I noticed that I was no, uh, like I will I remember one day noticing that I hadn't been sexually attracted to guys for a long time and that's when I realized that the sexual attraction the same sex sexual attraction for me was connected to lust so as lust went down, the same-sex sexual attraction went down. As I merged into the wolf pack of guys, and I finally felt that pure belonging, which is so important, the same-sex romantic attractions went down. And as I continued to grow in that and to have confidence as a man with the men, I no longer feared being a man. And that's when I realized that, wait a second, all those transgender pursuits that I had for so long, those were all in the days when I feared being a man. I feared everything about it, the responsibility. The, I feared the, the pains that I experienced when I was younger. I feared facing the, the, that guy that molested me. I, all these fears of, of, of manhood that I was afraid of. Um, after I rewrote those horrible things with good holy things, those fears went away. And I'm like, wait a second, I haven't experienced these transgender things for a long time. Maybe those things are connected. Well, they seem obviously connected to me. So, yeah. Wow. I mean, thank you for sharing that. I mean, it's beautiful that in the sense that everybody's got their own story and how all this stuff is going to play out. I mean, and some people, it could be instantaneous. I remember meeting a woman and she told me that she had lived a very promiscuous lesbian lifestyle with all these different women. And one day she's at home and gets a knock at the door and it's some complete stranger she's never met that just showed up at her door and said, God told me I need you to come with me to church right now. <laughs> and so this lady apparently received in prayer that she needs to go upstairs to that apartment, knock on that person's door with no clue who's going to answer it, tell him to go to church. And so for some reason, this lady follows her to church <laughs> and they go to mass and this, and this, this woman who had lived that promiscuous lifestyle is, is kind of, you know, very internally agitated as the mass is going on. Like something is really rumbling in her. And then, and she doesn't understand Catholicism or and the priest holds up the host and this woman basically blacks out. And she said, I saw around that, that thing, the priest was holding that bread or whatever it was every woman who I'd ever been in bed with, all of them around the altar and wow. blacked out and kind of came to and there were people praying over or whatever. And she said, you know, she had this kind of like St. Paul experience and the attractions were gone and she became this apostle to spread the message of chastity to people experiencing same-sex attraction. Hey, hey, if that's her story, like, hey, God works in mysterious ways. Sometimes he works in ways like yours of just like this went down and that went down. I think encouragement needs to be spoken to those who be like, okay, well, I did the chastity thing. My attractions aren't going anywhere. But I remember you sharing with me once that 
one thing that held you back from taking that first step down the whole chastity path was the fact that you had this insatiable longing to be a father and that you knew deep down if you really followed God until the end, he would never fulfill that desire in you because you can't get married in the church to another man and then you can't have kids. And so you're yearning for fatherhood would always be stifled. And if that's where this road is going to end, why take the first step? And so speak to that, that, that hope, you know, how did you find hope and trust in God with your body? How did I find hope? Uh, well, you know, uh, I'll sum it up with the words I have today for that is that I had gone through the thought of living in the vocation of no with a false vocation of no, right? Because you're gay, you can't do this or that. And that's just the way it is. And big bad church is going to smack you down because you've got to follow the rules in order to be a good Catholic. That was my mindset, you know? And then I didn't understand, under, I didn't understand the church is the upholder of truth. First of all, that it upholds truth that God has written into existence. I didn't understand looking at things through the lens of virtue through which my imperfect behavior would not be a cause for despair, but an opportunity to turn back to God, you know, massive mindsets had to shift. Um, but it went from a vocation of no, never, to not yet. And having hope in the idea that, that just because these attractions or inclinations are a part of my story, it no longer demands that I lock myself into that little box and say, that's who I forever will be with all of those hopes and dreams forever crushed. Because I'm, because I'm pursuing chastity, that makes uh, that's that makes the door open for holy vocation. You know, there's a really good book called To Save a Thousand Souls by Father Brennan. I really like it. I, anybody should read it, like men or women, but it's about priesthood. Um, and, and it talks about like one of the impediments to, uh, let's say, I think I'm not going to perfectly quote it because it's off the head, off my head. One of the impediments to entering like a religious vocation has to do with um, not – um, uh, it's not not whether a person experiences the attractions or not, but whether or not they're taking on more than that, like such as the idea that this is who I am, you know, this is my mindset, because then you're, you're dealing with a mindset that is decisively rejecting of chastity, as we talked about earlier. And so just learning about the idea that just because an attraction exists, it doesn't deprive me of the opportunity uh, to, to uh, pursue a holy vocational life. That's amazingly hope-giving. You know, and then people will say, well, you shouldn't be thinking about getting married because you're going to marry some poor girl. Then she's going to find out you're gay because you're lying to yourself and blah, blah, blah. And all I got to say to them about that is like, look, if 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 you want a holy marriage, period, anybody, you want a holy marriage, you want two people to be pursuing holiness, two people to be open to growing in the fullness of virtue. So regardless of what someone's attractions might be, if they're truly open to growing in the fullness of virtue and truly open to growing in chastity, God will use that and weave a beautiful, holy configuration with two people, regardless of what someone's attractions might be. And the other thing is that in that, God creates a desire for the holy attraction, a desire, uh, he, 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 he expands the desire in our hearts for holiness. And so, so, like, for example, suppose I still experience same-sex attractions. Even if I did, I don't want to go there. I didn't want to go back there. I wanted a holy relationship. And a holy relationship that would enter the romantic um, sexual realm would involve a female, and it would, not uh, at the very least, and it would hopefully lead to that, like, marriage. But the idea that God could never write a beautiful attraction that is holy and chaste to some of the opposite sex that's insane. That's ridiculous. That's putting God in a box. But that's what a lot of people do, including a lot of Catholics. They say, you know what, your vocation is no, and it's no forever. So you better learn to behave like a good little Catholic. And, uh, you know, we'll just quietly dissent. And maybe the church will finally catch up and change. As opposed to a hope giving message, which says, if you pursue chastity and holiness, God can use your gift of self to author a beautiful, holy attraction to a person of the opposite sex, who's also pursuing holiness, who will have the, a heart of such beauty that they will be able to understand that her past, your past, whatever, it, it, that is second to where you're going today and forward. Yeah, yeah. And, and I hope, too, that 
you know, that the answer to every person who experiences same-sex attractions is not necessarily marriage. It doesn't mean that marriage is going to be your vocation. Like, singleness right. is a calling that God gives to some people to do remarkable things in the church and in the world. And, like, the church isn't promising and God isn't promising in this life that the attractions will always necessarily change. But what he does promise is that he has a plan in mind for us. And I think people need to hear that because you might have some— young person listening right now and maybe she experiences attraction to other girls sexually and she might be hearing this I'm like okay well okay i want to be on board chastity thing that sounds good you know i'm not going to sleep with another woman i'm not going to do that i'm not going to do this i'm not going to look at gay porn or lesbian porn but you know can we just hold hands with another girl can can we just date and be chase like what would you say to a young person who you know is on board of the chastity thing but still wants to be able to express romantic affection in a you know, how do they, you know, what would you say to that person of why would that be wrong if we're not going to bed with each other and looking at gay porn? Like, can we at least do these things? Won't that bring us some fulfillment? What would you say? Well, that, that kind of rationale and thinking reminds me of like the like behavior management angle of faith as opposed to the virtue management angle of faith. For example, um, if you know that something is designed to lead you down a particular road and the, the end game of that road is not what is going to be fitting of what God's calling you to, then don't take those first steps. That's what I would say. And, and, and the other thing is that um, through the lens of uh, virtue, we discover a deeper meaning of intimacy. And for some reason, intimacy has, has been synonymous with sexual romantic exploration. Now, check this out. Every kid who's ever felt neglected or felt that no one loves them or whatever, who just needs a real hug, will feel good in that hug. Well, guess what? When they get that from somebody, they might feel that and be like, wait a second. I've been, I've been programmed to think that this good feeling means that I ought to belong in the arms of this person. Right? I experienced that. I remember uh, at, in a scary movie, I got hugged. I, I, was, I turned into a, a boy in my class and kind of got took in a little bit of a hug because I was terrified. But I was like, man, this feels safe. I feel safe here. Imagine the feeling that uh, a young person might have uh, when they uh, somebody expresses, let's say, a form of good, holy intimacy, but because they're so starved for touch and friendship and healthy attention from their parents who are also glued to these stupid phones. How what is the impact that it's going to have on that kid? You know, say, I really love belonging in this person's arms. So that's the whole romantic side of things, too. So so those things can point people to take further steps down particular roads. And that's the question I would invite people to consider is, is how do those things condition us for our next steps? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes a ton of st sense. And I mean, just what you're speaking is just the absence of chaste affection in so many people's lives. I mean, so many people may have been raised in homes where, you know, maybe their dad was, you know, I'm the protector, I'm the provider, you know, even when he's around. I mean, forget the deadbeat dads who, you know, take their pleasure but don't take the responsibility and leave the family. I mean, even the dads who are around maybe were raised in ways that weren't very affectionate. And so they think, well, I'm doing the dad thing by just putting a roof over your head and paying the bills. And meanwhile, that girl or that boy are literally starved for affection. And then they yeah. get any of that from the world. And it's just like, I mean, how, how do you blame them, you know, for, for wanting to pursue that? And, you know, for people in their lives, for people who have friends, family members who we care deeply about, who experience same sex attractions, you know, I've had some ask me, well, you know, what's your take on gay pride parades? You know, I want to support this person and show them that I love them, that I'm not going to alienate them. Because, you know, the idea is basically you either approve my behavior or you're abandoning me. You either endorse however I feel, whatever I want to do, my lifestyle, or you are bigoted against me, homophobic, and you reject me. And so how would you speak to that of someone who's like, well, what's your whole take on gay pride parades? You know, you know how should a Catholic, you know, consider those things? Well, you know, um, the first thing, I guess, uh, if someone was to ever propose something that even remotely sounded anything like emotional manipulation— we have the right, I believe, to stand up for ourselves and say that is not okay. You need to do this, otherwise this. Or you need to say this or believe this, otherwise this. Like, emotional manipulation is a real thing that happens. It's not everybody, but it happens. The other thing is that 
there is something to be said about the power of belonging. And in a pride parade, let's say, or within the LGTB community, there's definitely um, a way for people to feel belonging. So in a sense, you know, I can see the, the I can I can see the value in this. Let me explain this. I remember talking with somebody who was quite disturbed about a number of things, and entering into her pride community. Oh, hang on. Entering into her pride community actually allowed her a point of stability. And that brought her into a health, her into a healthier space than where she was before. So I can see that there is for in that particular case, it was good. But the thing is, what is the overarching aspect of what's going on? You're standing for a movement that whether you understand it or not, is advancing the cause that people ought to reject chastity, reject the fullness of virtue reject the fullness of holiness and therefore reject the fullness of Christ. And that's what you're participating in, in the pride movement. Um, so a person would need to weigh that out. Uh, um, so yeah, like, how, if someone, I guess, I guess, I hope people come to realize there's a difference between a movement and the people, right? Because there's lots of people who self-identify as LGBTQ people who are just trying to live their life, you know? They just want to live their life, and they're good people, you know? And they're they, they're living the only life they know how, just like I live, just like you live. But there is an attachment to a movement which, in its broadest sense, has its aim at the Catholic Church, which is upholding truth. And some of the most extreme activists, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it seems to me that even if the, the Church was completely... Uh, annihilated, it, it it wouldn't stop them because there's a, a, when we talk about that resentment, a resentment for for what is true. It's a rejection of truth um, in the sense that we talk about things like nature, right? My complement is a female. My complement is a female. God authored me as a man. That those are truths that that movement doesn't want people to take on. Yeah. Now, now so, if someone were to try to push back and say, well, well, yeah, you all, you're author this way or that way, but I was, I was born this way. You know, I was born gay. I was born lesbian. You know, what would be a response to someone who would use that phrase? Um, I say, I, I, I can relate to what you're talking about because for the longest, my oldest memories, I remember having those feelings too, you know, and, and, and so it, as it, but, but just because we experience a particular feeling or a desire, never in, in history has that meant that that's who we belong to in terms of a group. Um, although it's important to know that you're never alone. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'd really want to learn more about their story. And I would, you know, I, if I had the opportunity to be like, well, let's look, the, the coffee shop is down the road. You got an hour, man? Let's talk, let's talk, uh -huh. you know, because, because if you're, if that's your angle, I want to know why you think the way you do. And I hope that you might be open to hearing why I no longer think that way, because yeah. I think it's important when we listen to each other. No, I, I love that response because I think the knee jerk response in all of us is to come up with an apologetic answer of like, look, the genetic evidence shows this because in genetic, you know, in twins, we've got, you know, people carbon copy DNA, but one could experience this attraction, another. So there's point number one, you know, point number two, hey, nobody experiences sexual attractions in the delivery room as a newborn. It's not there. It, you know, it happens later with human development. Like we could want to just fire off all these apologetic points, you know, to show, hey, the genetic evidence is lacking for this gay gene and blah, blah, blah. But I love your response. Like, let's go do coffee. You know, let's go hang out for an hour. Let's listen to each other instead of feeling like I need you to hear my three best points against why people aren't born this way. Instead of yeah. like, hey, maybe I can make you feel heard after an hour of listening to your story. And so I, I love the approach. And so when people, you know, are trying to minister to these individuals, you know, everybody's taking different in in approaches. Some people are like, well, we got to get these kids into conversion therapy. And I know up there in Canada, you know, it's different than here in the States. Here in the States, we've got, I think, 20 states that have conversion therapy bans on, you know, putting minors in that. Um, 
Whereas I think there's still some leeway in the remaining 30 states and in all 50 if you're at a religious institution. But, um, you know, is conversion therapy the way to go? Is it always bad? Is it always good and need to be defended? You know, what's your take on there? Can it be helpful or is it always hurtful? Mm, you know, it's funny. Like we talked about language earlier, like the phrase conversion therapy definitely makes people think about different things. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I think I think that phrase has kind of been like pushed to the forefront because when when that phrase is brought up, it elicits a real emotionally driven response by the people in the world saying like, that is a horrible thing. How could you make someone convert from who they are? And you're going to use this crazy electroshock thing. I don't know, like these wacky ideas that people, but you know what? Some of these things actually were done back in the day. And I know a lady who actually undergone those and she said so they're horrible. And, and the, the negative effect of these crazy wild tactics. Um, but that's, that's what the world says people should think about when they hear conversion therapy. But I think that, I mean, well, I, I, I think that any, any, any therapy that is designed to like, look, our goal is to change you from gay to straight or from trans to non-trans. I think that is a kind of a dangerous thing. Basically for the same reason I said earlier, it could set someone up with these expectations of, of change, even if it's like unwanted, like I have it's unwanted attractions and stuff, but it would set someone up with an expectation set that that might be unrealized. And, and what, where does that leave a person afterwards? You know, it leaves a person with less hope and things like that. So, so I'll shift from the idea of conversion therapy, which by the way, again, the church doesn't endorse conversion therapy, which is great, or the church doesn't even endorse particular therapies for people to, who experience this and want to talk it out. So, um, but but the idea of therapy itself, I mean, if someone wants to go talk to somebody about the things that's going on in their lives, like, shouldn't they have the ability to do that? You know, I, I'm reminded of the whole, like, my body, my choice thing, which totally collapses on this topic because people are like, no, you're not allowed to go talk to a therapist about this attraction <laughs> you don't want. And like, you're a grown man, but you're not allowed to because my body, my choice only works in that other topic. And it's just... It's so funny how the, there's like, you know, different rules for different circumstances. So I think it's very important for people to talk about the, the things that they're working through in their hearts. That's what I think. And I think that it's a tragedy that there are laws coming in. And you might have like Bill C-8 in Canada is, um, is it's entering the realm where if a person uh, introduces ideas that are kind of outside of the 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 pro LGBTQ narrative, those could be deemed as conversion therapy. Gosh, even maybe this interview could be deemed in certain circumstances, a conversion therapy related interview, which is, which is tragic because what we're doing is sharing thoughts and ideas and stories. And, and these are things that have brought me and other people like to peace that they couldn't even get from therapy to begin with. Right. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm really, I'm really of the idea that, um, that I think is important for people to have that autonomy to be able to choose therapy as they wish. And if they, if they want to have therapy that it has that kind of in mind, fine, go for it. But just so people know the church doesn't endorse those therapies. I think that's important because there's a lot of people out there who, who think the church is literally trying to get people to take these therapies to become straight. One more thing. I know that there's something, something that's termed reparative therapy. And um, a lot of people, first things they think about, oh, you're repairing from gay to straight, and that's not what it's about. I've never gone through it or anything like that, but I know it's been described it's been described in depth on the Courage site um, about what it is and what it's not. And basically, it's like talking through your, your thoughts and what you're going through. You know, like maybe maybe you could say reparative of the soul. You're, you're looking at the bigger picture, but it's not to do with like fixing from gay to straight. And like, but the problem is so, so few people in the world are willing to like enter into this without becoming emotionally like, you know, let's go, you know? Yeah, so no, it's like that, that Latin phrase, abusus non tollit usus, meaning the abuse of a thing does not take away its proper use. And so yeah. because there have been some forms of conversion therapy that were coercive and damaging, to fall to the opposite extreme of throwing away the baby with the bathwater, of saying, hey, any type of therapy that's trying to help these individuals live a chaste life and you know identify their, as a son or daughter of God is bad, 
I mean, there's lots of guys, and girls who've gone through certain therapies like that and swear by them of like, you know, that I, I obtained so much personal growth and peace and happiness and so many issues in my life by going through that. And so, you know, can, you know, therapy of a person wants it or parents want it for their child can be done in a way that's fruitful. We just got to keep an eye out for the forms of therapy that can, I think, can do more harm than good. So to me, it's not an either or both and, but it's interesting you speak to that kind of that cultural double standard, you know, my body, my choice. Cause you see it everywhere <laughs> with this topic of like, I was supposed to speak in Ireland this past year. And when, when, you know, when the news broke out that I'm going to be speaking on chastity and, you know, some people are Googling me and they're like, Oh, well there's this guy and he teaches this about marriage and, you know, homosexuality. And I mean, people had a fit over there. I mean, the university of Ireland banned me from setting foot on their campus. One of the hotels where I was supposed to speak on chastity canceled the venue. Um, schools were backing out left and right. Several other schools jumped in and said, Hey, if you don't want them, we'll take the talk. And just so much controversy. And I remember one, there was a, uh, post by some, you know, equal rights movement on the uh, university campus, they tweeted out and said, hey, we just want to thank everybody who helped block, you know, Jason from speaking here. You know, your cooperation with us showed truly how diverse and inclusive our community is. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. Am I the only one who caught that? Like, you're blocking someone from speaking is revealing how their inclusivity, in my opinion, was simply exclusivity. But I mean, the double standard to me is extending in the schools where, you know, we're having this up in Canada, down in the States where let's say you got a Catholic high school and then the religion teacher comes out or the theater teacher where she's getting married to her partner. And then the school's put in this precarious situation of, okay, well, what do we do? Do we keep her on board? You know, while, she, you know, she's getting married next weekend to her female partner and, and there's kids that want to go to the wedding or do we just, you know, not renew her contract for next year and end up on CNN for the next week of the controversy <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's a, a tough issue, but I remember uh, there's a, a gal who, who blogs for our website sometimes, Arlene Spensley, and she wrote an editorial for the Tampa Bay Times on this issue, and she was discussing Archbishop Cordel Ar Salvatore Cordelioni, who's the bishop uh, out in San Francisco. It's a great name for an archbishop in San Francisco, Cordelioni, which means the heart of the lion. And, <laughs> you know, he set some policies into place where some teachers were let go if they were openly living that lifestyle. And it caused a firestorm of controversy. But what Arlene said is she said, wait a minute. She said, the world is putting the church in a no-win situation because the the world is saying that the church is full of hypocrites and there shouldn't be hypocrites in the church. But then the world gets upset if we ask our members not to live in a hypocritical way of, I believe <laughs> this, but I practice that. So either it's like heads, I win, tails, you lose kind of situation that, you know, the church has the obligation to make sure her teachers are not just teaching the faith, but living it as well. So it's not that, hey, you experience this attraction, you're going to get fired. It's like, well, no. I want people working in the schools and the churches that experience same-sex attractions. You know, I want the person giving me communion on Sunday sometimes to be someone who experiences same-sex attraction. Like, that can't disqualify from you from a job. But maybe speak to that of just how there's a distinction between a person having an attraction and wholeheartedly living out a lifestyle and believing that they have a right to teach in a religious institution. Well, I'll start with the opposite direction. So having the attraction... And where uh, and 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 having a heart that's open to growing in the fullness of virtue, that that's that's the number one thing. So yeah, the person giving me communion, I've given communion here and there, like when they need a person. Uh, well, I same sex attractions are part of my story, transgender part is part of my story, but I am striving to pursue um, a life of holiness and virtue, open to growing in the fullness of chastity. I'm not, uh, you know, out here trying to like, you know. Uh, so dissent and trying to like tell people that the church is wrong and it'll get with the times one day. Yeah. Right. So that's not, that's, that's, that's wrong thinking, you know, the church upholds true. Like it's not like, it's not like next month, a banana tree is going to start producing like, uh, you know, cucumbers, right. And we're like, Oh, we got to change everything now. That's not what the church does because it can't because truth of what has been authored is authored, you know? Um, so, so yeah, whether a person experiences same sex attractions and has a role as a teacher, as I did, uh, or, or, or is giving out communion. That is absolutely below the conversation that needs to happen. The conversation needs to happen of like, are they pursuing holiness today? Are they in a state? Or, or maybe I mean, in a state of grace. I mean, there's sometimes yes, but like, are they authentically pursuing holiness? 
And where that is not happening, then you have the backslide to the other way because there's no neutral ground in the spiritual realm. You have people who are um, uh, take, take, taking on these, uh, like, you know, they're, they're, they're going down the roads of uh, fulfillment within the LGBTQ mindset, which at the very least is counter to successful integration and counter to chastity. But now they're not only doing that, so they're rejecting chastity, but they're doing it in a public role. And often, sometimes, uh, kind of holding people hostage, say, you have to accept this because your church is supposed to be nice. And you're supposed to just let everyone in and belong. And it's like, but you're totally missing the point. You are literally exemplifying to the world that you are choosing to sin. You're choosing to sin by rejecting what God has authored. And you are making a production of it by going totally all public about this. And, and like, what is that? Like, what other organization in the universe do are, are people allowed to kind of like fight against the corporate mission statement, so to, be, so to speak, and everything is just fine? You know what I'm saying? It doesn't happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, I feel like a lot of times the the schools to, to make themselves play the victim or be like, oh, you know, our Bush bishop is bullying us into making this decision and I, we're being forced to do this because of that evil bad bishop, when in reality, the, the real issue is the Catholic identity of the school. I mean, the principal in the first place needs to be prayerfully discerning who he's hiring, not just in the religion department, but in the arts and theater and the math teachers, because like, do you live out this lifestyle of the Catholic faith? Or maybe even if you're not Catholic, you know, are you willing to live out a Christian example for our students? Because it's not only not fair to the teacher, that you're going to pull this card out two years later, you know, it's unfair to the whole student body who gets emotionally attached to this teacher, uh, falls in love with this teacher's personality and their love for the students. And then when this thing hits the fan three years later, I mean, you've got a coup on your hands with 700 students siding with the teacher who they care about and love deeply. And then if the principal's kind of there, oh, well, hey, the bishop made me do this. It's like now he's making the church be the bad guy instead of the real fault was this complete and utter lack of discernment at the beginning of the process who to bring on board. Because I don't know about your schooling experiences, but oftentimes the teachers who I learned the most from in terms of just living human life and spirituality were not the religion teachers. You know, they were the psychology teacher, the math teacher, history, who were just living the faith. I remember we had a psychology teacher in high school and didn't teach a lick of religion, none of that stuff. But man, all I remember is that guy loved his wife and kids so much. The guy, when he would even talk about his wife and kids, would start crying in class. And I'd think, isn't he a little overly attached to these people? Uh, but I just remember, I don't remember anything he taught me about Freud or Jung or, you know, this or that, cognitive behavior. Like, all I remember, dude, that guy loved his wife and kids. And so principals need to just open their eyes. Like, your kids, if it's an authentically Catholic education, are going to learn so much of just being in the presence of your faculty and the weight and the gravity that you bear as a leader of that school and prayerfully discerning and even fasting about who you bring on board, that's where this issue needs to get addressed instead of the mainstream news when some principal inherits this mess and then needs to blame the bishop for you know the choice that he has to make. But I think we got not only a lack of leadership in the schools, but even you know maybe speak to the lack of leadership in the church, You know that we've got leaders within the church dissenting. And trying to p- p- play like the cool uncle of like, yeah, you know, we don't need to do all that chastity <laughs> stuff. And, you know, we, we just need to welcome everybody. We've got to, you know, build bridges. And to me, if you're building a bridge without the second half of it, meaning chastity, you're just building a dock and then asking people to walk off it. So your thoughts? I appreciate that analogy because that's exactly what it would have been. If I would have encouraged, been encouraged to continue in the road of unchaste living, um, I don't know if I'd be around today, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, the, it's it's a tragedy that oh let's go back to the school thing for a second. It's a tragedy that like there's there's that separation because the kids become attached. I understand becoming attached to teachers, and but but the thing is those decisions have to be made because what's more important like the state of someone's soul and people say oh well, you're getting crazy. It's like no listen like when people are like a- advocating for things that are actually legitimately. Uh, rejections of truth um, that that doesn't just stay isolated it fans it it grows and things like that and so that puts at jeopardy the souls of all people who are influenced by that I know some people say that is absolutely what I just said but no seriously if somebody's if somebody's drawing kids to uh, think it's okay to enter into um, 
uh, what do you call it, the uh, rejections or countering of successful integration, um, that's a problem, especially if it comes in, uh, in a Catholic school situation. So the hard decision is made to say this has to stop. And you know what? Life goes on. You're going to find new other great people. That person might be really great who we let go. But, you know, we have an obligation to to teach actual Catholic teachings and not just um, appease feelings of the day. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, otherwise, what is our faith? Is it just feelings, you know, and desires? Like, do we actually stand for something? And how hard how have you ever have you ever um, like admired someone who stood up for nothing? You know, probably not. Nobody does. And the students don't either. We have to have leadership. So now I'm looking at the big picture. Leadership that stands up for something is really good instead of just trying to be like a cool uncle, you know. And, and here's what I've noticed about the cool uncle kind of crowd is that it, this, this, it always comes up like this, is that there's, 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 there's not a focus on virtue or if it is, it's, it's, it's tilted outside of the ways of the catechism. You, you certainly never point someone towards the catechism if you're dissenting. Um, but there is this idea that if you don't think you're sinning, then you're not sinning. And it's a consistent thing that I'm noticing, you know, like my desires are so strong, it couldn't be sinful, right? Or, you know, I always remember being this way. So God knit, knit me in the womb this way because of my desires and appetites. Never mind the fact that we feed and starve appetites of all types. And it's not like sexuality is some like little appetite that gets exempt from the whole neurological process. Um, but this idea, it, it's prevalent. It's that if you, if, unless you think you're sinning, you're not sinning. But the truth is you can sin without knowing that you're sinning. And at Catechism 1849, sin is the rejection of truth, my paraphrasing. And a little farther down, the more that we sin, the more we are predisposed to sin. And the more that we do venial sin, the more that we are predisposed to mortal sin. And as far as we, we continue on that, our understanding of what is true becomes more and more clouded. And so it's, it's, it makes, it's no shock to me why a uh, cool Uncle Catholic uh, is is peddling ideas that are decisively counter to the fullness of virtue, counter to successful integration, because a person who is who is gone down roads of God could only judge the fullness of someone's heart. But but as you go down those roads, it's harder to actually see what is true, and it's harder to point people towards the catechism. That's the other thing. So the rejection of uh, the rejection of the idea that you can sin without knowing it. And the other, the other is the rejection of the catechism and not pointing people towards the catechism. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, because people can be ignorant of their sin and it still be sin. The question is that, you know, was your ignorance vincible or invincible? In- invincible is like my three-year-old kid seeing Kit Kat and walking out, you know, grabbing out of the store. It's like, you know, you couldn't, you know, you didn't know that you're, you know, guilty of, you know, theft, you know. But when you've got a grown adult who could have formed their conscience, but decided not to. Because I think a lot of times when we get attached to sin, we protect our attachment to our vices. We find ways to justify and we, we, we protect our false attachments. And so, you know, you know, and one thing with the schools that, you know, came to mind as you were speaking is that, you know, those who've been kind of leveling attacks at the church over this whole issue, I think our, our, we, sometimes we take too much of a defensive posture against them instead of realizing, well, wait a minute, they're making some really good points here. Like one being that, uh, th- is it like, okay, the only issue that could get your contract not renewed at a Catholic high school is homosexuality. Anything else goes. It's like, well, wait a minute. You know, is the science teacher living with his girlfriend? You know, is this person outspokenly pro-choice in this department? Like, how come it's just the LGBT crowd that gets targeted with this stuff? Like, are we trying to live out our Catholic identity and all the parts of the administration and faculty or is it just those people we're going to go after and if it's if it if it, that's the only issue it looks like a witch hunt instead yeah. of what it really should be of just like hey maybe we need to take an overall look at the vision of our school and what our priorities are and this needs to apply to everybody including the janitor i mean we we all need to do embrace it so as a church you know what would you say how have we kind of dropped the ball as a church over the, on this issue, like, what does the church need to do? And like, what do we need to address really moving forward? So, you know, that we can be more, uh, you know, accompany these individuals in a more fruitfully pastoral way. So how have we dropped the ball? What do we need to do going forward better? Well, I think on like a systemic level, I believe is how I would phrase it. If I get snapped on my finger, make one change that would happen tomorrow. Is it every employment contract in a Catholic school? 
every employment contract in a Catholic school or a Catholic church or whatever would not be about behaving Catholic, would not be about doing Catholic looking things. We know of cardinals who did lots of Catholic looking things, but were doing horrible things behind the scenes, right? Mm -hmm. Catholic looking things is, means nothing. What does mean something is, are they open to growing in the fullness of virtue? And if we had contracts that were focused on that, of course, we can't know how virtuous someone is, but there are ways to tell if someone has decisively closed themselves to growing in the fullness of virtue, such as, um, you know, uh, advocating for abortion. There's one. There are such as marching in a pride parade saying, this is what I'm staking my belief in, even as an ally, because you're saying this is what I believe in. Right. And taking a public stand about it. And so it's not just about LGBTQ people at all. It's about all people, all employees, all leaders, all volunteers, for Pete's sake. How many volunteers sneak in who are, who are dissenting? Lots. It's like we could have this stuff and, and find out. And then if there was some kind of tell that was discernible with evidence that someone was buying into something and promoting an ideology that was counter to the fullness of virtue, then that would be it would be over. It wouldn't be about isolating LGBTQ anything. Like, um, you know, like Cool Uncle has brought up a good point. Yeah, like why does it always seem that it's always like LGBTQ teachers that, that are getting canned and no one else? Well, the answer is it's not that, but the media sure loves to pick up those stories. So there's a little bit of twist on the media there too, but his underlying point does make sense. Well, what about that person, that person? And he's right. Those people need to be also... Um, have, have those things need to be looked at. And if they're violating a contract that's based on growing in openness to growing in the fullness of virtue, then cut them, cut them. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I remember speaking at a Catholic high school as a teacher in service. So there are about a thousand teachers there and myself, um, a professor of philosophy and a great priest, we're each going to give an address on the topic of gender for all of these kindergarten through high school teachers, a thousand of them for one diocese. And, you know, so we presented our papers and uh, afterwards, I remember one teacher coming to me and she said, you know, I don't necessarily agree with all this gender theory stuff where you're coming from at it because she said, how do we really know there's only two genders? She said, how do we know that it's not the case that maybe perhaps because of the literally thousands of years of patriarchal male oppression against women, that the genes of women are now morphing into new genders in order to resist the male patriarchy. And I'm sitting here kind of listening to this out of like, I'm like, well, I, I had, I had not considered that as, as an option. And, you know, I'm just, and when we, you know, charitably talk through things, but all I'm thinking is my head is like, okay, you're in charge of teaching 1000 women, 1000 young women are going to spend four years in their, in your presence before they go off to college. I mean, the schools are a tremendous opportunity for evangelization or de evangelization. And so, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a battleground. And so what, you know, as we wrap up, like, what are the resources out there? not only for teachers, but for individuals experiencing same-sex attractions, parishes, you know, what type of apostolates, ministries do you think are on the cutting edge? Because there's lots of people doing stuff, but who are the people that you find are doing it right and, and most fruitfully? Uh, I will, I'll get to that in a sec. Can I just go back to what you said about oh, yeah. the, the gender expectations? It, it just dawned on me. It's kind of like, you know, the uniqueness of the human being, right? Well, we all have unique perspectives on things. And since there's a lot of perception in gender and how I, did, how I see myself, it's kind of the idea that if this trajectory continued on, we would literally have as many genders or perceived genders as there are human beings, technically, mm -hmm. if, 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 if things expanded to the infinite kind of degree. And, and like the, the, the other thing that I always think about, the first thing I thought about when you brought that up is like, well, maybe, you know, the gender is changing and transferring the chromosomes. It's like, well, look, it's like, who <laughs> who would aliens come to take if they needed to take two human beings to repopulate some other kind of planet? What would they do? I, I, don't, I just don't know how else to frame that in a way that is, like, uh, more simple. You know what I mean? They'd probably take a male and a female. And, I, I mean, I would bet a dollar on that one, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, <laughs> as for resources um you know uh so of course there's there's the courage apostolate which uh which will probably be illegalized under bill c8 because it provides a place for people to explore ways to live holy chaste lives who people who desire to live holy chaste lives um and that's and, up in canada uh, you're saying so that's that's fantastic it was fatherhood 
And, and that's in Canada, just to clarify for the listeners, making it oh, illegal. Bill's, yeah. Bill Skate is in Canada, but I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if those things trickle down to the USA a lot faster than what everyone's thinking. You know, it just seems to be that these are hitting people by surprise. So, yeah. uh, so to that end, by the way, one one of the things I I respond with now is just literally like, how many kids need to regret their transition before we'll start opening our mind to the broader picture? How many more kids need to reject their gender transition before cool Uncle Catholic decides to stop promoting this idea as something that is the thing that you should do? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. How many- now, who's out there speaking on that? Like, who's out there? What ministries are out there on the whole detransitioning front? You know, from what I what I found is that there are it, it Jason. It really comes down to people who are becoming emboldened to share their stories. A lot of ministry groups are uh, are are not touching it. So, outside of like courage, which allows people to find that brotherhood and find peace and know that they're loved by God. Um, there's a couple others, and I think they might be listed through Courage, but I think I would like to point people to Courage only because I know that they have, like, the thumbs up from John Paul II and approved by the Vatican. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, just to start there. Um, but there's tons of great resources. Like, any any of the resources, the Catholic resources that are focused on growing in, in the joy of the gospel and, and coming to understand virtue, I think are just fine. Things like like related to uh, like, I mean, I know I've got a little video on Ascension press and I know that there's another lady, Kim Zember has a nice video from a female side on Ascension press. That's cool. And you've been so gracious with me uh, to have this opportunity. Plus I've, I've written a few blog articles on your site. I know that you have, a, 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 uh, have opened your heart to allowing us to share our story um, and, 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 I, and other places. And a lot of what's really cool right now, this is super cool is that Catholics and non-Catholic Christians alike are like walking away from LGBTQ like a lot. There's a lot of people. And I'm, I'm, every day I'm being exposed to more and more of these people, like, you know, different uh, backgrounds, different socioeconomic, different race, whatever. But there's a common unity in Jesus Christ. And it is like, this is, this is amazing. And those people are emboldened to share their story of finding joy in the Lord. And they're, we're all creating these like ways in which our stories can be shared. And we really hope that people can continue to share those things. And, um, and, you know, like every, not every movement, but lots of movements start just like that. They're just people who, who, who share the stories on the underground, because I mean, it's like a David and Goliath sort of situation right now. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We know, of course, but, um, but I, 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 w- I would start by, by the courage. Oh, and, 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 you know, like, uh, you know, Father Mike Schmitz has an awesome talk. You got that great talk on the, the Steubenville thing. Um, I start with those kinds of things, you know? Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll put in the show notes here on the podcast, um, the, uh, link, as you said, to courage to Father Mike Schmitz talk. Uh, we have, uh, lots of blogs by you. I'll point people there and then they can watch different videos. We've got desire of the everlasting Hills, the third mm-hmm. way Eden invitation, all kinds of different yes. stuff that different groups have done. So I'll just put those in the show notes. And then for you, Hudson, as we wrap up, how can people connect with you and your work, uh, besides just me pointing to them to your blogs, what kind of resources do you have or, uh, what would you recommend there? Um, well, I, I, I just have the occasional blog posting with different Catholic groups, but I, I have those things on a website right now, which also might become illegal. So <laughs> contact me before it's too late. Uh, it's my name, HudsonBiblo.com. And I'm not trying to be somebody famous. It's just a place to store my articles. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, if you if something in here is going to touch your life, all glory be to God. It's got to be for God. And then spell Biblo. <laughs> yeah, good call. B. Y B L O W Hudson. Well, Hudson, I cannot, I cannot thank you enough for your, your heart, your intellect, your faith, your soul, and the gift that you are to everybody. Listen to this. And I would just ask all the listeners to please uh, pray for Hudson and, uh, and his protection and his, you know, from the evil one. And, and I don't mean uh, the Canadian government, I mean, Satan. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but from, you know, any, any oppression, just, just, keep, just continue to pour your blessings upon him that he can continue to be a gift. Um, just to share the good news of this topic because it's it's good news i mean it's tough it's a sign of contradiction it's a cross but it's good news and so i thank you for your courage not only in proclaiming it 
but most of all for living it. So Huds, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a blessing to be with you today. All right. God bless you, Jason. Thanks so much.